So hello everyone. Welcome to our uh, Young Achievers Symposium organized by the Center for Socially Responsible AI at Penn State University. Today, we are delighted to have Ryan Shi as our guest speaker. Ryan is a PhD candidate of Social Computing in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University and founder of 98 Connect, an organization to promote open communication and sustainable collaboration between the technology and nonprofit worlds. He works with nonprofit organizations to address social challenges in food security, wildlife conservation, and public health with AI. Um, some of his work has been adopted or slated for a field test. He organized the AI for Social Good Symposia in 2020 and 2021. He is recipient of uh, a CIBO Scholar and a Carnegie Mellon Presidential Fellowship. So without further ado, let's welcome Ryan for his talk. All right, uh, thank you, Hanjie, for the introduction. Uh, let me see, let me share my screen here. Okay. Okay, so yeah, thank you everyone for uh, coming to this talk and having me here. So um, uh, I'm Ryan Shi, I'm currently at CMU and really glad to have this opportunity to uh, virtually visit Penn State and talk about uh, my work in the past couple of years. Um, so my research, in a, in a word, my research is basically I work on AI for nonprofits with nonprofits so that it could be used by nonprofits. And I want to talk about, like, talk, basically talk through some examples of the projects that we've been working on. And for today, uh, I'm really just going to focus on our work with uh, food rescue. So this whole thing got started in, like, in 2019. Uh, the, that was like three years ago, I came across this nonprofit organization, uh, which does food rescue. So like, we were just curious, uh, my friends and I, we signed up for a task with that organization. And on that day, our job was to pick up some food from a local restaurant and then deliver it to a veteran program's office. So, you know, um, it turned out that this was harder than I expected. So first of all, we spent like 20 minutes just trying to find the restaurant because it was located inside a huge hospital building. And then this was what I got from them. And also another thing is at that point, we didn't have a car. So it was another head load, uh, just trying to get on the bus and all that. So finally, when we got to the destination, which is here, like a veteran programs office, um, we were told that their, their program for the day was over. Um, so they weren't sure if they could store the food till the next day. And, you know, it, was, it wasn't exactly very smooth. So after that day, I was thinking about, about this whole experience and I thought maybe there's something that AI could help with food rescue. So I drafted a list of research questions and then I sent my email like asking if they wanted discuss some of these questions with me and their response like um I don't know, like like how to say it, like their response at the very least they weren't immediately thrilled by my list of questions um but in the following month i kind of i i did something i i, I went on rides with their truck drivers and also i went into their office to shadow uh, like their dispatchers in the office and then after all of this, we were finally able to sit at the table for a discussion. And basically what I'm gonna tell you, tell you now is kind of what they told me at that point. So um, food waste and food insecurity are two very important problems that unfortunately coexist in many parts of the world. Um, so there's about 1.4 billion tons of food that's wasted every year. But at the same time, like, 15% of the US population still suffers from some kind of food insecurity. But even that number sounds big, but still um, like the amount of food that goes to waste is so huge such that 
even just 20% of our wasted food would be enough to feed all of us in food insecurity. So obviously this is a big opportunity for people to address this issue. And among them, there's just this type of nonprofits called food rescue organizations. So basically they serve as the intermediary between the food donors and food recipients. And most of their transportation relies on external volunteers. And in this way, they are able to um, like scale up with the very limited budget that these nonprofits typically have. Um, so let me explain in a bit more detail what a particular rescue looks like uh, to a volunteer. So each volunteer has, um, has a smartphone app. And so you see here, like that's the interface of this app. Um, so each, uh, so first of all, the dispatcher at the food rescue organization, they will match a donor and a recipient together. And then after this matching information will be published on the smartphone app by sending a push notification to the people. Um, so then the volunteers can see this information and then they can claim it on the app and then just go out to pick up and deliver the food. And the, like basically that's kind of how this whole thing works. So the, organi the particular organization I've worked with uh, is called 412 Food Rescue and they started in 2015. And actually a couple of days ago, it was their seventh anniversary. Um, so they have already grown a network of over 30,000 volunteers and thousands of donors and recipient organizations in the region. So as I said, they rely on external volunteers. Um, this definitely helps them scale, but also relying on volunteers means uncertainty. Like, obviously, how can you make sure that a rescue will get claimed by some volunteer? And this means that a critical task for these kind of food rescue organizations is to figure out how to better engage with their volunteers. And since we started to work with them in 2019, we've pretty much been focusing on this issue, like how to engage with volunteers on this crowdsourcing platform. So we, we, we started simple, um, building the collaboration and then dive deeper, um, get things deployed. And then we zoomed out a little as well to tackle some common pain points that we observed in these kind of studies. So um, let's see. Okay, and then I'm gonna get started with our first project. Um, so this was our initial attempt at improving the efficiency of uh, food rescue platforms. So as I said, uncertainty is really the beast here. And to address this uncertainty, our first idea was to build a predictive model um, of, uh, to predict when the rescue will be, whether the rescue will be claimed. So when a rescue is posted, we, um, we can uh, use all the features from this rescue to predict this kind of binary label. And this prediction result will then be able to help the uh, dispatcher like to determine basically when, um, which rescue needs special attention from them. So in this part, the main challenge is that we have a relatively small data set. Um, and one way out of that is to carefully design some features, uh, like these features related to like timing of the rescue, like the weather on that day or like the locations. And uh, basically the location, I mean, like both the physical location and the popularity of the volunteers in the neighborhood. And another way to deal with this problem is like uh, ensemble methods, of course, like we, we, we show that a stacking model that combines um, Gaussian, pro Gaussian processes like a random forest and some uh, shadow neural network um, can provide um, predictions with almost perfect precision. And like precision here is very important because um, it means that the rescues that are predicted to be claimed are indeed claimed. And because like this is important because like we don't want a want, we don't want to predict a rescue to be claimed, but actually it turned out to be unclaimed. That would lead to food waste and discourage donors and recipients, which is basically bad for everyone. But I mean, that is just a prediction and we can use this prediction to characterize the uncertainty, but can we actually do something more to reduce that uncertainty? And to understand that issue, let's first take a look at what's happening uh, behind the scene of the food rescue. Um, so when a rescue is published, 
first they will send out a wave, first wave of notification to all the volunteers within a five mile radius of the pickup location. Um, if the rescue is not is not claimed after 15 minutes, then the platform will notify all the other volunteers on the platform. And if like if like say like it's less than 60 minutes before the deadline, um, and if the rescue is still unclaimed, then the human dispatcher at the food rescue organization they will jump in, and then they will contact some volunteers they're familiar with through like phone calls or like text messages. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how they engage with the volunteers. But one caveat with this system is that there is not enough human dispatchers. I, I, I shadowed their dispatchers um, for a few weeks, and I can, I can assure you that this was not an easy job. Um, it's a huge burden for them to monitor all the rescues and like all the pot potential incidents that could come up. And also the, the thing is like, too many push notifications would also make volunteers feeling really bored and it's, it's also not beneficial for the platform. So with this in mind, we set out to optimize this notification and intervention scheme uh, by basically just adjusting the distance parameter and, and the notification waiting time parameters. So basically like, like the X, Y, and the values um, like it's showing in the previous slide, like we are basically just trying to find the uh, best value for X, Y, and Z. And to put it more concretely, what that means is that we can minimize the number of app notifications sent to volunteers uh, and also the number of human interventions needed. Uh, so minimize these two things subject to the constraint that the expected claim rate should not go below what they are now. Um, so this parameter uh, lambda here is just like controlling the relative importance of these two op optimization objectives. And we can use historical data to estimate these expected, uh, these expected values and then solve this problem through some branch and bound method. But still, um, one major challenge here is that we don't know when the rescue would be claimed under a, diff under a different notification scheme. So all the data we received from the food rescue organization, they were based on one single notification scheme that they've been using for the past five years. Um, and in this work, we made do with the data we had by making some counterfactual assumptions. Um, for example, uh, we assumed that the same volunteer would claim the rescue, but maybe at a different time. So let's say, um, suppose a volunteer uh, receive a first wave notification under the original scheme and then claim it like 10 minutes after the publication. So now let's say if under a new notification scheme, that particular volunteer would fall into the second wave notification zone, then the volunteer would claim this rescue in 10 minutes plus the gap between the first and second wave notification time. Um, and also by varying the, the lambda in our optimization objective, we could um, plot a Pareto frontier and then find um, two, actually two promising uh, schemes that could improve over the current practice. So we like basically for the first one, like that's what we actually use. So for the first one, uh, we sent, if we send the first wave notification uh, to volunteers within 5.5 miles of the pickup location, and then wait for 16.5 minutes, to send the second wave and then ask the human dispatcher to intervene 45 minutes before the deadline. Um, if we do that, then we can hopefully reduce the human intervention without increasing the volunteer notifications. And in fact, this new scheme has been adopted by Foreign to Free Rescue since February 2020. Um, we collected and analyzed the data uh, before and after this deployment. But as we all know, um, COVID uh, changed everything. Um, so we, um, it, so basically in Pittsburgh, the life here was in, was significantly impacted uh, starting from March 2020. So uh, we separated the data from before March and after March. And what we observed is that after the new scheme is deployed. Uh, the claim rate went up. Uh, the average time from publish to rest to uh, claim went down, 
and also the number of push notifications went down. So all these three metrics are mo were moving in the desirable direction. And this trend continued after COVID impacted the area. And this, this preliminary results are promising, but I, I want to make a point here that um, there, there could be many, many confounding factors. And this was not a, a controlled experiment. And to get a more confirmative claim um, about this impact, we would need to actually run, run a more rigorous study about that. Uh, so what I just talked about was a quick and simple attempt to improve the notification scheme. But however, that notification scheme is a completely distance-based notification scheme. Um, it would apply to all the volunteers and rescues indiscriminately. Um, so, and then in our second piece of work, we kind of, um, after we established this trust between our partner and us, uh, we went on to explore a rescue specific notification scheme. So with a distance-based notification scheme that I talked about earlier, you are sending notifications to people who are nearby. But I mean, is that the best criteria? And does that work well for all rescues? I mean, we can, we can take a look at how it performs. Um, with a five mile notification radius uh, that they would be using, um, on average, uh, for each rescue, we will notify like 964 volunteers and the hit rate is about 44%. And this like 44% sounds a, a bit underwhelming uh, if you're looking at it at first sight. And actually that's what we thought too. And then we thought seems to be a, quite some room for improvement. And then essentially what we want to do next as a second step is to figure out how do we send notifications to the right people. So the problem becomes pretty clear now. Given a rescue trip with the fixed donor recipient time and all those information, can we find the best 964 volunteers to send push notifications to? And in, in the second piece of work, we formulate this problem as a recommender system problem. So the rescue is the user and the uh, volunteer is the item. So we want to recommend volunteers to a rescue. And now um, for a recommender system, typically one would use either a content-based approach or a collaborative filtering approach. And in this work, we didn't use uh, collaborative filtering. And the reason is about the cold start problem. Uh, the cold start um, is pretty much when you have a new user or a new item, you don't have Old data for them. So the thing is, um, although there have been some work trying to mitigate the issue with uh, collaborative filtering uh, on cold start, the problem with our case is that cold start in our case is not just a short and pleasant period at the beginning, but is that it, it's like we are always stuck in the cold start. Like it's our entire problem because every rescue is new. Like when a rescue comes onto the platform, we make a prediction and then it's gone and then we get a new one. So we always deal with new rescues. So obviously we, we just we didn't go with a collaborative filtering approach. Um, and then of course, talking about the content-based approach, we need to like really dive into the data to, to, to like kind of do some feature engineering. So first of all, here's this map of the distribution of donors and recipient organizations. So as you can see, there is a high concentration of those organizations in the downtown and near suburbs of Pittsburgh, but the whole region of interest is pretty huge. So we kind of divided the, the, the center of this region into a three by five grid world, and then lumped all the outer suburbs as one region. And some other patterns we observed were that um, distance clearly played a role, of course, but also uh, new volunteers tend to be the most active, especially right after they're signing up. And the weather also has a different impact on urban versus like suburban regions. Um, so based on these kind of data analysis, for each pair of uh, rescues and volunteers, we, ex we are able to extract all these features. And like, for example, how many rescues have a particular volunteer done in the past in this particular donor's neighborhood or in the recipient's neighborhood? and how long have they been on the platform. So like, in fact, most of these features, like I have uh, like five, six, uh, three, we had a little bit more than that, but most of these features are suggested by our collaborators at the food rescue organization and during our meetings. And exactly because of that, 
it would be much easier for them to understand the machine learning model uh, later when we present the results and performance of the algorithm to them. So I also want to briefly talk about negative sampling, um, which is a pretty important thing uh, whenever people do a uh, uh, recommended system. So if we don't do any negative sampling, the, the negative to positive ratio in our data set would be 9,000 to 1. Uh, that number comes from, we in our data, we have roughly 9,000 volunteers in this area and each, each rescue is claimed by one person. So um, to reduce this imbalance, first of all, we try to downsample the negative set. Um, for we, we try to filter out who have actually received the notification. Because for example, if a rescue is claimed before the second wave notification went out, then clearly that non-existent second wave should not contribute any data points. Um, so that alone brings our ratio to 700 to one. And then um, remember that I, I talk about like, if a rescue stays on the platform for a while, nobody came in, then the human dispatcher will step in. They will call the some volunteers. And we got the call data uh, from that organization and we use that as a more credible negative data set. Like it's more credible because um, obviously it's harder to decline a request on phone than just you know, ignore a push notification on your phone. And finally, um, at each iteration of the uh, training, like whatever, like gradient descent based algorithm you use, uh, we, um, we sample, um, we, we first like use all the positive data points, of course, and then use all the negative data points from these call records, and then sample a subset of the negative data points from these push notifications so that the final um, ratio in each batch of data is roughly three to one. And just quickly look at the results. Uh, so this main performance metric is a hit rate at top K with K equal to 964 for a fair comparison. Um, we found that like a neural network recommender system achieved a hit ratio of about like 72%, uh, actually nearly doubling the 43% hit rate for the default scheme. And we tried a bunch of other models and they were all better than like the default scheme, but they are not as good as the neural network. And we think the main reasons are primarily that first of all, like the, the neural network was a bit more expressive. And the second, or maybe more important is that with the neural network, like with a gradient descent based training algorithm, we are able to um, have additional leverage to use uh, to control in the negative sampling that I just talked about. So, we almost doubled that hit ratio, which is which is great, but uh, that's not the end of the story. Um, so we plotted this histogram after we saw that number. And this, this histogram is the number of push notifications received by each volunteer in the test set. Um, and we got this figure. So the yellow bar here is the neural network thing and the blue bar, the default notification scheme. So like, what's our ML model doing here uh, on the right? Uh, like, uh, it's, it looks weird, and um, there's about 450 volunteers in this bar here. And what that means is that this machine learning model discovers a small subset of volunteers and then basically just send them notifications all, all the time. And this turned out to be a pretty big problem. Um, because after we investigated who those volunteers are, we found that uh, basically the machine learning model is discovers some really active volunteers that have done most rescues in the past and then send them notifications all the time. And these volunteers are in some sense, the most valuable volunteers and they could easily get annoyed by this kind of, um, this flooding them with push notifications. And then like eventually they might actually leave the platform. So that's kind of ironic, you know, like we set out hoping to improve the claim rate but if we directly go deploy this model, it might actually make things worse. So how to solve this problem? Um, it's solvable, of course, and an intuitive idea is to put a cap on how many push notifications that any volunteer could receive every day. So you know, instead of greedily taking the top K volunteers, this now becomes an optimization problem. Um, say we have a current rescue I and the decision variable X here is like the binary variable, whether we should send notifications to this volunteer. 
and then we'll maximize this predicted uh, claim probability with the p that are just directly the ML models output. And then like uh, we subject to some constraint like at most k volunteers per rescue. And the additional stuff here is this last uh, second to last line. Like each volunteer will receive at most L notifications every day. So in this way, we can kind of ensure this kind of budget constraint. But there is one last piece to this puzzle, which is uh, to enforce, you know, to enforce this upper bound, uh, how many notifications you can receive. We kind of need to know what rescues will happen later in the day. But we don't know that. Like these rescues arrive onto the platform in an online fashion. Like we, we don't, we cannot, we don't, we cannot know what's going to happen, but we can use the past to predict the future. And how we did, did this is actually a pretty simple idea. We, we just use sample the rescue trajectories from like seven days ago, or like 14 days ago, and so on. And the reason is that a lot of the donors are like grocery stores or schools and companies. So grocery stores, they do weekly inventory checkups and schools and companies, they usually have a lot of like weekly events that have leftover food. So the patterns uh, on the same weekday are kind of similar. So we can use um, these kind of uh, what happened like last week or two weeks ago to predict what's going to happen later today. And then in this case, uh, we can pretty much just strictly enforce the 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 like the push notification budget constraint, and this becomes the final kind of online planning algorithm. So looking at how the performance of this new algorithm, um, so look, first of all, look at this uh, histogram that we examined earlier. Now we have an additional set of bars on this red one. That's the online planning part. Uh, so we see that um, we are no longer exclusively bothering the most frequent volunteers. But of course, at the same time, uh, we now have this notification budget. Um, and that parameter, obviously, is, is some parameter can be tuned and it will definitely impact the hit rate. But in this particular case, uh, we saw that um, even with a very mild budget, like six notifications a day max, we can still get uh, a hit ratio of above 60%. Uh, which is still much better than the current 43% hit rate. And uh, uh, finally, for, for completeness, um, so I just talked about that we sample the past res rescue trajectories as a substitute for the unknown future rescues. And we actually want to examine whether this substitution makes sense. And to evaluate this thing, we can consider a offline planning problem uh, where we hypothesize that we, we could, suppose we could see into the future and we could directly plan with the future rescues in mind. So that's a hypothetical situation, um, but this will always lead to a better hit rate than our algorithm. But we can kind of compute this gap between these two. And we saw, uh, and we will call this gap the price of online planning, which is just like the, the difference in, in like one minus the ratio. And we saw that uh, with like any reasonable budget values, like about five or six, like we are always able to keep the this uh, performance gap between uh, less than ten percent. So in some sense, like we can say that like using the past um, last week's uh, rescue trajectory to predict the future is a pretty reasonable choice here. But uh, final question: um, We've been going after the hit rate so far in this talk, but. It, is it really the only thing we care about, or is it actually um, like do, do we actually care about something else? And so to we don't know, but uh, I mean obviously we care about a lot of other stuff, but uh, without actually running the this um, on the ground, we won't know what the what would be the impact. So right now we are um, planning a randomized trial with Find to Food Rescue to actually test out this algorithm. And uh, this test is scheduled to, to, to start in a couple of weeks and hopefully we'll get some more rigorous analysis of the evaluation of the algorithm than what we did with the, the first piece of work. So, okay, so far um, I've, I've talked about these two very applied projects um, about food rescue, but um, while we were working on those projects and also other projects uh, we've been working on, we felt that there were some common pain points in working on machine learning with data science with nonprofit and public sectors. Um, so we want to take a step back here and then from, step back from the application and then try to address some of those pain points. 
So which turned out to be our recent work on bandit data-driven optimization. Uh, we propose a new paradigm for machine learning in nonprofit settings. So before I go into the details, let's take some time to consider for four questions. Okay, so for each of these questions, let's see, um, suppose you are working with a nonprofit organization on a data science project. First, uh, let's see, uh, suppose you've got through the hurdles of the initial discussion and all those legal stuff, you, and then you finally got all the, like the DOA sign. Um, uh, you, like the, your collaborator now sends you their data. And did you ever find out that what they call a data set is an Excel spreadsheet of a thousand entries, but somehow they expect you to run a magical deep learning algorithm on top of it. That's the first one. And the second thing, um, now let's say data science is no longer a problem. But then your collaborator hopes that you, as their AI expert, they hope that you can tell them what's the best intervention they should take. But the thing is, their entire data set was collected under a single default intervention that they've been using for however many years. So now how are you going to solve that problem, right? It's like, um, like, that's going to be a pretty tricky question if you kind of make a counterfactual assumptions. And now, uh, let's say you've, suppose you now you've worked for several months on this project and your collaborator will finally test out your proposed intervention the next month and you feel great. But the night before deployment, you just become more and more upset. And, and why? Because like you start to worry. You, you worry whether you model the problem correctly. Maybe there's some additional policy objective that you didn't consider. And if that turned out to be true, then your solution could be arbitrarily bad in practice. And this last question really ties into it is that I, um, for like AI for nonprofit like researchers, we want our work to be impactful, but there will also be unintended consequences as well. So how, so can we try to account for the unintended consequences of our interventions in a more principled way? So if you've worked on the ground in this kind of um, AI for nonprofit domains, hopefully at least some of these questions resonate with you. But, but in any case, these four questions should sound familiar to you because I just raised them when I introduced the previous two projects. So the small data problem, um, the all data collected under default intervention, like unintended consequences of push notifications, and the, the, the question of, do we really care about the hit ratio or do we only care about that? So um, when I talk about those questions just now, there we, we might or might not have a good answer to those questions, obviously. But here, starting from this thing, we want to propose something that starts to address these issues. And this paradigm that we are going to propose in this work is called um, banded data-driven optimization. Um, it has connections to several different lines of work, um, like say, like uh, such as uh, data-driven optimization, offline RL, but it's kind of technically most connected to contextual bandit. And basically it is like a principled integration of offline machine learning prediction models with online bandit algorithms. So it's like an iterative procedure. Okay, so at each time step, first we receive a feature vector. This feature vector is in a sense of supervised learning that we have featured the, uh, for the machine learning model. And then we use an offline ML model, um, which is trained on all the previous data points to predict the label. Um, so then with this predicted label, we can decide on what action to take. And after we take the action, we get the cost of taking that action, as well as the true label of the of that feature vector we received already and i want to talk about this cost uh, for a bit more here so the cost consists of two components the first component cost is um, is known to us a priori that represents our understanding of the domain like we we spend we actually we spend a lot of time trying to make sense of the background knowledge and this cost uh, is p which is the inner product of the label and the action and the second component of the cost is unknown, uh, this Q. This is a bandit cost. Um, this is our acknowledgement that, you know, even though we try very hard to model the policy objective, there will still be something that we didn't know. 
And this cost um, is kind of a linear function of our action. And this uh, banded parameter mu is unknown to us, and we need to learn that. So uh, we, we could use tools from optimization to address the first one and use tools from online learning to address the second one. Oops. Hmm. OK, and then the last thing I want to talk about for the model formulation is this uh, optimal policy and regret. So optimal policy um, is basically given a feature, this pi, it will minimize the expected cost um, given this feature x. And the regret is also defined in a conventional way. Like the regret of any algorithm is just the total cost incurred by the algorithm minus the total cost incurred by the optimal policy. Um, but that's uh, so that's kind of the, the, the problem setup. But like um, how to actually combine the advantages of like online learning and the offline predictors and optimization in a in a unified framework um, is kind of what we did in our in, the, in our recent work. So there we we kind of we proposed this new paradigm and we also developed an algorithm. So this algorithm is called proof or like uh, predict then optimize with optimism in face of uncertainty. Um, so it is basically a kind of an integration of the well-known Lean UCB algorithm with offline ML like regression models. So you can see some traces of the UCB algorithms here where we define this confidence radius here and then keep a running estimate of the uh, bandit reward. And then here is kind of where we integrate the offline predictions with the bandit part. So in Lean UCB, you would just have this um, new times, you're trying to minimize this new times W. But here we add in the ML output here and then minimize them jointly. Um, and then we were able to formally prove that this algorithm achieves sublinear regret. The first step of the proof is a rather simple one. So um, let's consider a toy case. A toy case where um, the cost is completely known. And that is um, the, like the unknown part of the cost is zero. This is a completely like a toy example, but it will be useful for us uh, going forward. So in this case, here um, is the target problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, we want to minimize the expectation of this known cost P given the feature X. And in our framework, uh, we have a ML predictor, uh, F hat, which will generate a prediction C hat. So that's the target problem, but we cannot directly solve that problem. So our actual problem that we're solving is um, to minimize this C hat times W, um, and we call the minimizer uh, W star of C hat. So on this particular data point, uh, the regret is just C, the true, the, the true label, times the difference between our committed action W star of C hat minus the optimal action, the actual minimizer of the target problem. And then we can prove that if we solve um, this problem in this way, if we try to solve this actual problem that we show here, we are actually able to achieve sublinear regret. And this, I mean, this sounds very intuitive, right? Like, but uh, this is not completely trivial because um, this is kind of a, our algorithmic choice. Like nobody forces us to solve this problem. Um, and then we will proceed from here uh, by analyzing this per round regret. The next step is to actually uh, get rid of that toy example to think about the, the proof algorithm here. Now that we have um, uh, both the known part of the cost and the unknown part of the cost. And a key result here is that we could separate the regret incurred by this possibly inaccurate machine learning model from the regret incurred by the unknown bandit cost. Um, so you see here, like the first term here in this regret is the bandit regret. It is expressed in terms of like the time t and the confidence radius beta. And then the second part of the regret is the regret incurred by the ML model. And you can pretty much see that this is kind of just um, completely determined by how accurate this ML model is. Um, so we can decompose and like, um, the, and then the, the intuition here of the proof comes from like the previous case uh, where we had the per round regret. Um, so we can decompose this, the, the regret using 
a cleverly chosen midpoint in the confidence ball so that we can disentangle both parts. And yes, uh, then we can pretty much bound the whole regret in terms of root t. Uh, and I was actually lying to you a little bit because um, the proof algorithm I've been talking about so far actually made one simplifying assumption. And that is the assumption that the action that we take won't change the label distribution. Um, but you know, this was one of our initial motivations right, for proposing this whole frame. So we, we, we want to remove this assumption. And this is kind of the final uh, full blown proof algorithm that we're showing here. To account for this additional uh, like uh, complication, we, we had to add a uniform exploration phase into the, uh, into the algorithm. So this is actually necessary in a sense, because uh, if you think about it, like, we, we want to learn, if we want to learn a good ML predictor for all the possible distributions, then you got to have some data points from each of them. And so that's what this uniform exploration phase is trying to achieve. And here we proved a similar regret decomposition bound uh, and the regret bound suffered a bit. Now it's dependent on like two thirds of the uh, time step, uh, but it's still sublinear. And so if, if you're familiar with the banded literature, then you might have noticed that all the theoretical results that I have presented here, uh, the, at best, they are roots T regret, which is not better than just vanilla in UCB algorithm. Um, but we found that our algorithm actually performs much better in practice than vanilla banded algorithms. So here, um, the proof algorithm is the orange curve here, and the linear CV is the red curve here. So we see that in general, under all these different variations of like the, the numerical simulations, uh, our algorithm is able to reduce the regret much faster and also with much smaller variance. Um, and now tying this back to the volunteer recommendation problem I talked about earlier. Uh, let's think about it uh, in the banded data driven optimization framework. So at each time step, we get a new rescue. Uh, the features are the same features we talked about earlier. The label is still the same kind of label, like whether zero one label, whether the volunteer claimed the rescue. Uh, the action is still like indicating whether we send notifications to this each particular volunteer. Um, so no, the known part of the cost is like uh, like whether we try, basically still like the, the, the loss function in the ML model. Like we're trying to see whether we send notifications to the right people. And then we have this unknown part of the cost. Uh, this could encode how the volunteers might react to notification. Like for example, some volunteers might get annoyed if we send them too many notifications. So previously we tried to account for this stuff with a like a um, budget parameter. But like, right, like how do you set that parameter and how do you get that personalized? Um, here, we can actually, we are simply able to just learn something that can effectively act for that um, in that way. And look at the, some of the results here. Um, we see that like basically proofs uh, algorithm still in orange here, uh, does still outperforms me UCB here and actually by quite a lot. So uh, compared with the, I want to make a point comparing this with the numerical simulation results we saw in the previous slide. Um, in this set of experiment on the food rescue data, um, the setting here has gone wildly out beyond the simple setting in that numerical simulation and beyond the setting for which we proved the theoretical regret bounds. And like we're using neural networks and some all, the, like all the crazy stuff that comes with it. So I want to make a point here that the proof algorithm could be like a modular algorithm that one could insert different um, learning algorithms and optimization problems into it. So, okay, so that's um, food rescue and that's kind of uh, the main chunk of the work that I want to talk about in today's uh, presentation. And, but at a high level, uh, we've also done some other work and uh, at a high level, like my work can be classified into three categories. Um, there's the applied AI for nonprofit projects and the technical AI research inspired by those projects and some something I would call AI for nonprofit research proper. And let me let me let me briefly talk about each of them. 
So aside from the food rescue, we've also worked with the uh, Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank on an inventory processing problem. And we are also working with the WWF on an NLP project uh, and also work with uh, Carlos Slim Foundation in Mexico to improve the vaccination rate for kids. Um, so with this kind of work, I really need my work being, uh, insist on my work being immediately useful and deployable. Um, for example, I talked about the deployment and the pilot study with the food rescue earlier. And also with the WWF project, like we are currently running a pilot study with WWF where they can mark in their internal GIS system about the location, uh, all these small red pins here. The, the, these are the locations where we identify a threat to conservation efforts. Um, but this all kind of th this kind of work takes a lot of time, of course, and a lot more time than actually doing the research itself. But really, like I, I think like the people that we are able to connect by doing this type of work are really worth it. Um, and I also worked on technical AI research questions uh, that are inspired by these applications. So, for example, um, we we proposed a. Uh, um, like to use the PSRO framework um, to um, green security game on the great world. That's um, that's basically uh, a very that's a very big game, and the game tree could be even be deeper than poker. And we solved it using this kind of double oracle kind of algorithm, and um, also inspired by wildlife conservation applications, we we rigorously studied how to find Stackelberg equilibrium when like one of the players has the power to manipulate the payoff of the game. So it's like, there's the, say like there's the government could set penalty when a poacher gets caught and then how do you set that penalty to effectively deter the poacher? And we also kind of um, propose an end-to-end -end learning and planning pipeline with kind of optimality guarantee to defend against unknown attackers. So this was motivated from the cybersecurity domain where, but it could also be like a general purpose uh, deception game framework. So with these kind of projects, we try to ask the right question based on our firsthand experience uh, working with this nonprofit, knowing about the pain points in those applications. And finally, this is something I want to discuss a little bit. Uh, you've, you've probably seen this mysterious um, green arrow dangling there and maybe wondering what that means. Um, so uh, I haven't talked about it yet, but I, I, I'm referring to AI for nonprofit research. Uh, typically, when we talk about this kind of research, um, um, we would either enumerate by application areas or we would enumerate by like technical domains. Um, but what I mean by AI for nonprofit research here on this slide uh, is a bit different. So I want to ask the question is, uh, I want to ask, will AI for nonprofits stop just being an umbrella term? And will there be a research problem for AI for nonprofit itself? You know, a problem that is not limited by um, an application domain and a problem that is not limited to a technical field. But of course, that the problem shouldn't be too broad. It should still capture the essence of the work on AI for nonprofit. And I think maybe there is, and I'm currently working on uh, one such problem and I hope to report back to you in a year's time. And you know, this kind of really nascent topic could complement the graph that I've shown here. Instead of this linear relationship um, I've been showing all along, we could actually form a cycle. So, Applied AI for nonprofit projects would inspire new technical AI research problems. And these kind of technical research problems will make room for what I would call this AI for nonprofit uh, research proper. And that in turn would guide our applied projects. So the kind of the operational impact will come from these applied projects. And then the kind of methodological impact would come from the other two things. And all three of them would generate the ecosystem impact. Um, so yeah, I'd like to thank my advisor and my committee members. Um, they, they really, they allow me to work on this crazy stuff and all my academic collaborators. Also like, I'm very fortunate to have worked with these uh, very wonderful nonprofit organizations and the great people at these places. Without them, like none of this work would have been possible. So yeah, that's my last slide. Uh, I think, um, you know, um, thinking about like uh, uh, what I 
try to do in my PhD is that I just try to do one thing, which is to work on AI for nonprofits with nonprofits so that it could be used by nonprofits. Like um, again, and again, I, I realized that this is such a difficult thing to do that I'm only scratching its surface at, at present, but it's also a very fascinating thing to do that I hope to keep working on it uh, for the years to come. And uh, yeah, also encourage all of you to join me uh, working on this kind of stuff. And uh, thank you so much. And I'm now happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ryan, for your wonderful talk. Do we have questions from the audience? Yeah, thank you, Ryan, for your talk. Um, I had a question about the cold start problem that you had started talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I may have missed this, but how did you end up solving it or uh, addressing it? Yep, let me let me see. Okay, um, so the cold start problem, um, because we pretty much just, uh, we, we, we chose to not use the collaborative filtering approach. We went with a completely content-based approach. That means for each pair of user and item, we just generate a bunch of features so that like these kind of features will, we can still generate the features for data points that we didn't see in the training data set. So in that case, the cold start problem won't, won't be a problem with our approach. But I mean, of course, this has both upsides and downsides. I think um, what the, some what enable us to actually use this method is that we are not operating on a gigantic data set. It, it was a huge data set. Um, so we had about 10,000, we had about like 15,000 users and about 9,000 items. So if you multiply them together, it's not small, but I would also say that it's also much, much smaller than like many industry applications, which where you definitely have to use a collaborative filtering approach. So that would be my answer, yeah. And so just a quick follow-up. So what ended up being the key features, like the most useful or the most predictive features, or can you not tell? Uh, we were able to tell. Uh, so the most predictive features are actually the, the, the first two or first three. I mean, they are kind of um, correlated, of course. So it's like how many rescues have this particular volunteer done in this particular donors or recipients neighborhood? Uh, like if they have been to this place um, several times earlier, then they are more likely to do it again. And the, this feature, I think the, these three features, um, and, and I think that's exactly the reason that we saw initially when we trained the machine learning model, we saw that the ML model puts so much emphasis on the volunteers who have done a lot of rescues in the past. Um, and then, um, but also like these features are exactly what's suggested by our, like the practitioners at the food rescue organization. So that when we presented this result to them, they were saying, yeah, yeah, definitely. That, that, that's very, 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 very likely going to be the case. Yeah. But you also kind of over notified them and you worry that that might kind of uh, irritate them. Yes. Kind of thing, right. So uh, did that problem ever get solved or is that something that... Uh... Yeah. So, in any way? yeah. So like with our, like, so we train this model and then we observe this problem. And then the, the way we try to solve it is basically just to put a upper bound on how many notifications you can receive every day. Oh yeah. Um, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I remember yeah. now. So the regret came down, right? Regret came down dramatically with your most recent algorithm. Uh, uh, yes. If you look at this, this histogram on the uh, uh, top left, Yes, so the like uh, with this new algorithm uh, in red, like we are no longer exclusively bothering volunteers, uh, a small subset of volunteers. Okay, okay. Very cool. Thank you. Sure, yeah, no problem. Yeah, just a follow up to the Shamir's question. So, how do you um, quantify the feature importance? So, how do you know what, what's the most in, uh, you know, in, in the previous slide, how do you know that this feature is the most important feature? Uh, 
Okay. Yeah. I guess you're talking about the, the yes. those yeah. features, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, there are different ways that you can try to characterize the feature importance. Uh, I guess, like for example, you can uh, use some like like um, the way we kind of came up with this list of final list of features is that we started with uh, like maybe like just a, a couple of them, and then we try to add each at one and then see what results we get and then see if it's useful to keep them inside the feature list. So um, with that, you can basically, for example, you can calculate the delta um, in the performance. And then these kind of features, uh, these three features give, typically give you the, 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 most, um, the most, the greatest feature importance, I would say. And, and yeah, yeah, and there's also different other ways. Like for example, you can well, we didn't take that approach, but you can like say perturb the values there and see um, the difference in the performance. Right. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, one of our project we also you know look using the same approach to determine the feature importance. So yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, another you know a broader um, question is about you know about to your experience to, you know, with the nonprofit organization. So you mentioned in the beginning that first of, uh, in the very, uh, you know, for the first time you approach with the nonprofit organization, they do not, you know, get excited about your proposal. So, so how do you eventually convince them, you know, to take uh, this approach with you or take yeah. the experience with you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like uh, we could have an hour-long conversation on how, how this thing go, but uh, I would say that um, first of all, um, I really like um, a quote by um, um, Edward Felton. Um, um, he is a professor at uh, Princeton. He had he delivered a keynote at NeurIPS 2018, and he was saying that um, I don't remember exactly, but the, basically it was like if you want to become someone that the decision maker wants to call when something comes up, then um, you gotta, then you are in a position to actually do something that's impactful, but you don't get to be that person just by volunteering. Like you get to be that person by continuously engaging with those decision makers. And I think that's kind of um, uh, similar in terms of how we work with nonprofits is like, uh, at first, I indeed I said like like I like I had that experience, and then I drafted a list of questions, and then I would say that most of the questions on that list we actually didn't work on it even till today. Like we've been working with them for three years, and we didn't get to work on those questions. The reason was that uh, those questions were perfectly legitimate research questions from a technical like academic research perspective, but they were not either they were not needed by that organization. They don't think that's a problem worth solving or they didn't have the resource to act on it. Like we could train, like, like we could as well, like we get the data from them and then we could train a machine learning model. And then if it doesn't actually get to the field, it only stays on our, on our computer, then the, the impact is very little. So it's kind of like, uh, that's also a struggle when I usually work with these nonprofits at first is that I, at first when I, when I try to work with them, um, I always had this kind of research problem in mind. Like for example, like as you probably um, kind of um, observed a little bit when I introduced my kind of other work, when I started my PhD, I was um, mostly doing research in game theory. Um, at that point, when I talked to these nonprofits, I thought, how could I use my expertise in game theory to solve problems for them? But the problem is, um, it's very likely that they don't have a problem that needs to be solved with game theory. And then what do you do? Like, like, like um, you, you might have the temptation to talk them into some problem that could use your expertise. But then the better way, I guess, at this point, now that I'm thinking about it, is that to kind of leave my existing expertise off the table and then just to listen to them and then uh, really like figure out what they want to be solved and what could possibly be solved um, and what could make the most impact or the use for the people that they are serving. And then whatever technique that might be needed for solving that problem, I learned it after that. 
And then, so that's basically kind of the approach that I'm currently taking right now. So th this is kind of uh, that, but that's, that's for the applied projects that we've been talking about. Uh, for the technical research projects, the other kind of technical research, that, that's a whole different thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a very, um, yeah, because, you know, it's difficult, you know, because there is that misalignment between the academic and what they really want. So, yeah, so that's a very good answer, you know, to how to address this kind of gap between them. Yeah. Mm, right. So do we have other questions? Yes, I have a question. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for your presentation. I said I missed the first part, but um, I really enjoyed your talk. And I'm just wondering, um, like, in addition of hit rate, did you measure other downstream variables? Maybe I missed that. But I'm also wondering how you communicate the recommendation to the system. So just the background, I'm from communication, College of Communication. So I'm really interested in, like, how to communicate this type of recommendations to users in order to persuade them to take actions. And you mentioned that uh, you want to motivate those infrequent volunteers to take actions, right? So I'm just wondering, do you have any like techniques of communicating the recommendations where everybody just received the same message? Or... Sure, yeah, I mean, these are all great questions, um, but you asked several questions. Let me see if I can unpack them uh, one by one. Um, so first of all, you're talking about the additional metrics. Um, so let's see. Uh, yeah, we have, obviously we, we did care about some additional metrics. Let's see if I can, yeah. So the hit rate was one thing, which was kind of the direct optimization objective for the machine learning model. But uh, it, when we actually run, deploy this, that's for the first part of the work, we actually had a couple, a few other metrics that we are looking at, like how many, uh, how many rescue get claimed in the end? And like how, how fast are they get claimed? And then overall, how many notifications are we sending to people? Like um, obvious, like for these kind of metrics, we have some, each of them has some desirable direction that we want to go for. And then these are also the, the basic set of variables that we are going to measure in our um, pilot study with them in the next couple of weeks that we, that's going to launch. Um, so that's the first set, first question. And then the second question was um, how to communicate the, the recommender systems output to the users. Um, so, um, so right now what we are doing is that um, when we actually deploy this uh, model in a field test, uh, we are actually I am actually going into the, the, the code base of this food rescue organization's uh, mobile app. And then I can implement this whole, integrate this whole machine learning model into their um, application. And then basically when, when they, when, like originally they have a set of criteria to determine who send notifications. And that was completed based on distance. And now we basically just replace that layer of logic with this machine learning model. And then what we can do with the actual text of the push notification is that uh, we could um, be more descriptive about not just saying, okay, so here's the new rescue trip coming up. Do you want to do it or not? And we can be more um, descriptive and saying like, like, oh, like you've done four rescues in this region in the past month. Like, do you want to get another one? Or like, uh, it seems like, or something like, uh, like you've been inactive for like uh, two months, do you want to get back in here? Like those stuff are actually used as the input features to our machine learning model so that we can directly use them also in the text prompt um, in the push notification itself. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers. Uh, wait, yeah. I thought you have another question or no? Uh, did, did I miss anything? I think that's it. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I think it's really interesting because in persuasion literature, we have some like food in the door techniques. Like, if you did something, then uh, of a big favor, then if I ask another favor, you're more likely to agree. So I think it will be interesting in the future to incorporate those kind of persuasion techniques. Oh, to, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I, I would be happy to like uh, chat more about this offline about like, uh, like how to actually, you know, um, as you said, like, like persuade the, the, the users into like, uh, or like something like nudging the users into um, yeah. like, um, like actually claim the rescue. And yeah, I, I would love to chat more about this offline. Yeah. And that's yeah. Some, something that we are also um, interested in doing in our upcoming pilot study. Yeah. 
Sounds cool. Thank you. Sure. Okay, if we do not have other questions, so let's thanks Ryan for this wonderful talk. And I will see you guys, uh, you know, two or three weeks later. Okay. Thank you, you Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Hanji. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Yeah. Bye. All right. Bye.